World War Z, An Oral History of the Zombie War, by Max Brooks. Introduction It goes by many names. The Crisis, The Dark Years, The Walking Plague, as well as newer and more hip titles such as World War Z or Z War One. I personally dislike this last moniker as it implies the inevitable Z War Two. For me, it will always be the Zombie War. And while many protest the scientific accuracy of the word zombie, they will be hard pressed to discover a more globally accepted term for the creatures that almost caused our extinction. Zombie remains a devastating word, unrivaled in its power to conjure up so many memories or emotions, and it is these memories and emotions that are the subject of this book. This record of the greatest conflict in human history owes its genesis to a much smaller, much more personal conflict between me and the chairperson of the United Nations Post-War Commission Report. My initial work for the Commission could be described as nothing short of a labour of love. My travel stipend, my security access, my battery of translators, both human and electronic, as well as my small but nearly priceless voice-activated transcription pal, the greatest gift the world's slowest typist could ask for. All spoke to the respect and value my work was afforded on this project. So needless to say, it came as a shock when I found almost half of that work deleted from the report's final edition. It was all too intimate, the chairperson said during one of our many animated discussions. Too many opinions, too many feelings. That's not what this report is about. We need clear facts and figures unclouded by the human factor. Of course, she was right. The official report was a collection of cold, hard data, an objective after-action report that would allow future generations to study the events of that apocalyptic decade without being influenced by the human factor. But isn't the human factor what connects us so deeply to our past? Will future generations care as much for chronologies and casualty statistics as they would for the personal accounts of individuals not so different from themselves? By excluding the human factor, aren't we risking the kind of personal detachment from a history that may, heaven forbid, lead us one day to repeat it? And in the end, isn't the human factor the only true difference between us and the enemy we now refer to as the living dead? I presented this argument perhaps less professionally than was appropriate to my boss, who after my final exclamation of, we can't let these stories die, responded immediately with, then don't, write a book, you've still got all your notes and the legal freedom to use them, who's stopping you from keeping these stories alive in the pages of your own, expletive deleted, book? Some critics will, no doubt, take issue with the concept of a personal history book so soon after the end of worldwide hostilities. After all, it has been only 12 years since VA Day was declared in the continental United States, and barely a decade since the last major world power celebrated its deliverance on Victory in China Day. Given that most people consider VC Day to be the official end, then how can we have a real perspective when, in the words of a UN colleague, we've been at peace about as long as we've been at war? This is a valid argument, and one that begs a response. In the case of this generation, those who have fought and suffered to win us this decade of peace, time is as much an enemy as it is an ally. Yes, the coming years will provide hindsight, adding greater wisdom to memories seen through the light of a matured post-war world, but many of those memories may no longer exist, trapped in bodies and spirits too damaged or infirm to see the fruits of their victory harvested. It is no great secret that the global life expectancy is a mere shadow of its former pre-war figures. Malnutrition, pollution, the rise of previously eradicated ailments, even in the United States with its resurgent economy and universal health care, are the present reality. There are simply not enough resources to care for all the physical and psychological casualties. It is because of this enemy, the enemy of time, that I have forsaken the luxury of hindsight and published these survivors' accounts. Perhaps decades from now, someone will take up the task of recording the recollections of the much older, much wiser survivors. Perhaps I might even be one of them. Although this is primarily a book of memories, it includes many of the details, technological, social, economic and so on, found in the original commission report, as they are related to the stories of these voices featured in these pages. This is their book, not mine, and I have tried to maintain as invisible a presence as possible, those questions included in the text are only there to illustrate those that might have been posed by readers. I have attempted to reserve judgment or commentary of any kind, and if there is a human factor that should be removed, let it be my own. Turning the Tide, Robben Island, Cape Town Province, United States of Southern Africa 
Zolelwa Azani greets me at his writing desk, inviting me to switch places with him so I can enjoy the cool ocean breeze from his window. He apologises for that mess and insists on clearing the notes off his desk before we continue. Mr. Azani is halfway through his third volume of Rainbow Fist, South Africa at War. This volume happens to be about the subject we are discussing, the turning point against the living dead, the moment where his country pulled itself back from the brink. Dispassionate, a rather mundane word to describe one of history's most controversial figures. Some revere him as a saviour, some revile him as a monster. But if you ever meet Paul Redeker, ever discussed his views of the world and the problems, or more importantly, the solutions to the problems that plague the world, probably the one word that would always cling to your impression of the man is dispassionate. Paul always believed, well, perhaps not always, but at least in his adult life, that humanity's one fundamental flaw was emotion. He used to say that the heart should only exist to pump blood to the brain, that anything else was a waste of time and energy. His papers from university, all dealing with alternate solutions to historical, societal quandaries, were what first brought him to the attention of the apartheid government. Many psychobiographers have tried to label him a racist, but in his own words, racism is a regrettable byproduct of irrational emotion. Others have argued that in order for a racist to hate one group, he must at least love another. Redeker believed both love and hate to be irrelevant. To him, they were impediments of the human condition, and, in his own words again, Imagine what could be accomplished if the human race would only shed its humanity. Evil? Most would call it that, while others, particularly that small cadre at the centre of Pretoria's power, believed it to be an invaluable source of liberated intellect. It was the early 1980s, a critical time for the apartheid government. The country was resting on a bed of nails. You were the ANC, you had the Ithanka Freedom Party, you even had extremist right-wing elements of the Afrikaner population that would have liked nothing better than open revolt in order to bring about a complete racial showdown. On her border, South Africa faced nothing but hostile nations, and in the case of Angola, a Soviet-backed, Cuba-spearheaded civil war. Add to this mixture a growing isolation from the Western democracies, which included a critical arms embargo, and it was no surprise that a last-ditch fight for survival was never far from Pretoria's mind. This is why they enlisted the aid of Mr. Redeker to revise the government's ultra-secret Plan Orange. Orange had been in existence since the apartheid government first came to power in 1948. It was the doomsday scenario for the country's white minority, the plan to deal with an all-out uprising of its indigenous African population. Over the years, it had been updated with the changing strategic outlook of the region. Every decade, that situation grew more and more grim. With multiplying independence of her neighbour states and multiplying voices for freedom from the majority of her own people, those in Pretoria realised that a full-blown confrontation might not just mean the end for an Afrikaner government, but the Afrikaners themselves. This is where Redeker stepped in. He revised Plan Orange, appropriately completed in 1984 with the ultimate survival strategy for the Afrikaner people. No variable was ignored, population figures, terrain, resources, logistics. Redeker not only updated the plan to include both Cuba's chemical weapons and his own country's nuclear option, but also, and this is what made Orange 84 so historic, the determination of which the Afrikaners would be saved and which had to be sacrificed. Sacrificed? Redeker believed that to try to protect everyone would stretch the government's resources to breaking point, thus dooming the entire population. He compared it to survivors from a sinking ship capsizing a lifeboat that simply did not have room for all of them. Redeker had even gone so far as to calculate who should be brought aboard. He included income, IQ, fertility, an entire checklist of desirable qualities, including the subject's location to a potential crisis zone. The first casualty of the conflict must be our own sentimentality, was the closing statement for his proposal, for its survival will mean our destruction. Orange 84 was a brilliant plan. It was clear, logical, efficient, and it made Paul Redeker one of the most hated men in South Africa. His first enemies were some of the more radical, fundamentalist Afrikaners, the racial ideologues and the ultra-religious. Later, after the appall of apartheid, his name began circulating among the general population. Of course, he was invited to appear before the Truth and Reconciliation hearings, and of course he refused. I won't pretend to have a heart simply to save my skin, he stated publicly, adding, no matter what I do, I'm sure they will come for me anyway. And they did, although it probably was not in the manner Redeker could have expected. It was during a great panic, which began several weeks before yours. 
Redeker was holed up in the Drakensburg cabin he had bought with the accumulated profits of a business consultant. He liked business, you know. One goal, no soul, he used to say. He wasn't surprised when the door blew off its hinges and agents of the National Intelligence Agency rushed in. They confirmed his name, his identity, his past actions. They asked him point blank if he had been the author of Orange 84. He answered without emotion, naturally. He suspected and accepted this intrusion was a last minute revenge killing. The world was going to hell anyway, why not take a few apartheid devils down first? What he could never have predicted was the sudden lowering of their firearms and the removal of gas masks of the NIA agents. They were of all colours, black, Asian coloured and even a white man. A tall Afrikaner who stepped forwards and without giving his name or rank asked abruptly, You've got a plan for this man, don't you? Redeker had, indeed, been working on his own solution to the undead epidemic. What else could he do in his isolated hideaway? It had been an intellectual exercise. He never believed anyone would be left to read it. It had no name, as he explained later, because names only exist to distinguish one from others. And until that moment, there had been no other plan like his. Once again, Redeker had taken everything into account. Not only the strategic situation of the country, but also the psychology, behaviour and combat doctrine of the living dead. While you can research the details of the Redeker plan in any public library around the world, here are some of the fundamental keys. First of all, there was no way to save everyone. The outbreak was too far gone. The armed forces had already been too badly weakened to effectively isolate the threat and spread so thinly throughout the country they could only grow weaker with each passing day. Our forces had to be consolidated, withdrawn to a special safe zone, which, hopefully, would be aided by some natural obstacle such as mountains, rivers, or even an offshore island. Once concentrated within this zone, the armed forces could eradicate the infestation within its borders, then use what resources were available to defend it against further onslaught of the living dead. That was the first part of the plan, and it made as much sense as any conventional military retreat. The second part of the plan dealt with the evacuation of civilians, and this could not have been envisioned by anyone else but Redeker. In his mind, only a small fraction of the civilian population could be evacuated to the safe zone. These people would be saved not only to provide a labour pool for the eventual wartime economic restoration, but also to preserve the legitimacy and stability of the government, to prove to those already within the zone that their leaders were looking out for them. There was another reason for this partial evacuation, an eminently logical and insidiously dark reason that many believe will forever ensure Redeker the tallest pedestal in the pantheon of hell. Those who were left behind were to be herded into special isolated zones. They were to be human bait, distracting the undead from following the retreating army to their safe zone. Redeker argued that these isolated, uninfected refugees must be kept alive, well defended and even resupplied if possible, so as to keep the undead hordes firmly rooted to the spot. You see the genius, the sickness? Keeping people as prisoners, because every zombie besieging those survivors will be one less zombie throwing itself against our defences. That was the moment when the Afrikaner agent looked up at Redeker, crossed himself and said, God help you man. Another one said, God help us all. That was the black one, who appeared to be in charge of the operation. Now let's get him out of here. Within minutes they were on a helicopter for Kimberley, the very underground base where Redeker had first written Orange 84. He was ushered into a meeting of the President's surviving cabinet, where his report was read aloud to the room. You should have heard the uproar, with no voice louder than the defence minister's. He was a Zulu, a ferocious man who'd rather be fighting in the streets than cowering in a bunker. The Vice President was more concerned about public relations. He didn't want to imagine what his backside would be worth if news of this plan ever leaked to the population. The President looked almost personally insulted by Redeker. He physically grabbed the lapels of the Safety and Security Minister and demanded why in hell he brought him this demented apartheid war criminal. The minister stammered that he didn't understand why the president was so upset, especially when it was he who gave the order to find Redeker. The president threw his hands in the air and shouted that he never gave such an order, and then, from somewhere in the room, a faint voice said, I did. He had been sitting against the back wall, now he stood, hunched over by age and supported by canes, with a spirit as strong as vital as it had ever been. The elder statesman, the father of our new democracy, the man whose birth name had been Holy Hlahla, which some have translated simply into Troublemaker. As he stood, all others sat, all others except Paul Redeker. The old man locked eyes on him, smiled with that warm squint so famous the world over, and said, Lolo, Lolo Huam, greetings person of my region. 
He walked slowly over to Paul, turned to the governing body of South Africa, and lifted the pages from the Afrikaner's hand, and said in a suddenly loud and youthful voice, This plan will save our people. Then, gesturing to Paul, he said, This man will save our people. And then came that moment, the one that historians will probably debate until the subject fades from memory. He embraced the white Afrikaner. To anyone else this was simply his signature bear hug, but to Paul Redeker. I know that the majority of psychobiographers continue to paint this man without a soul. That is the generally accepted notion. Paul Redeker, no feelings, no compassion, no heart. However, one of our most revered authors, Biko's old friend and biographer, postulates that Redeker was actually a deeply sensitive man. Too sensitive, in fact, for life in apartheid South Africa. He insists that Redeker's lifelong jihad against emotions was the only way to protect his sanity from the hatred and brutality he witnessed on a daily basis. Not much is known about Redeker's childhood, whether he even had parents or was raised by the state, whether he had friends or was ever loved in any way. Those who knew him from work were hard-pressed to remember witnessing any social interaction or even any physical act of warmth. The embrace by our nation's father, this genuine emotion piercing his impenetrable shell, Azani smiles sheepishly. Perhaps this is all too sentimental. For all we know, he was a heartless monster, and the old man's embrace had absolutely no impact. But I can tell you that was the last day anyone ever saw Paul Redeker. Even now, no one knows what really happened to him. That is when I stepped in, in those chaotic weeks when the Redeker plan was implemented throughout the country. It took some convincing, to say the least, but once I'd convinced them that I'd worked for many years with Paul Redeker, and more importantly, I understood his way of thinking better than anyone left alive in South Africa. How could they refuse? I worked on the retreat, then afterwards during the consolidation months and right up until the end of the war. At least they were appreciative of my services. Why else would they grant me such luxurious accommodations? Paul Redeker, an angel and a devil. Some hate him, some worship him. Me, I just pity him. If he still exists, somewhere out there, I sincerely hope he's found peace. After a parting embrace from my guest, I am driven back to my ferry for the mainland. Security is tight as I sign out my entrance badge. The tall Afrikaner guard photographs me again. Can't be too careful, man, he says, handing me the pen. A lot of people out there want to send him to hell. I sign next to my name, under the heading of Robben Island Psychiatric Institution. Name of patient you are visiting. Paul Redeker.